Welcome everyone to Helm 101. Thanks so much for being here. How many of you have ever used Helm? Raise your hand. Wow, that's a lot of you. How many of you have never used Helm, just heard of it? Oh, cool. It's like roughly even-ish. A good mix. Yeah, yeah, that's great because we have content for both of you. So it's good. All right, oh, yeah. so we're going to give a couple of introductions. We're going to um, talk a little bit quickly about who we are. We're going to try something fun. We're going to introduce each other. So get a little bit of uh, learning of our own stuff. So who we are exactly, um, Michelle and I, uh, we're Helm Core maintainers. Uh, we're part of the project, and we've been working on it for a couple of years now. Um, we're both from Microsoft, or Microsofties is the cute term um, that we call ourselves. Um, huge Taylor Swift fan, so happy to talk about anything about that. Um, and then big holiday beverage connoisseurs, love the whole Starbucks holiday line. Um, we really, really miss holiday spice flat whites, wish they would come back. But we've got uh, pumpkin spice lattes and eggnog lattes and all that, so we're good. So I'm going to introduce Michelle, and Michelle is going to introduce me. And we haven't practiced this, so we don't know what we're going to say. Oh, yeah. So Michelle Helm Core Maintainer, um, she is part of the CNCF a Technical Oversight Committee. Um, a little fun fact about her and I when we first kind of met for the first time. Um, so I was part of a company called Optimand, and when we were eventually acquired by Engine Yard, we had a first offsite in Florida, was the first one. Mm -hmm. And we were both realizing that both of us were the youngest engineers of each of our companies. We were trying to like compare who's the youngest between the two of us, because it was like a little bit of competition. Um, and she was a little peeved because I eked her out by just a few months at that time. So um, I, I totally became the youngest engineer at the engine yard. So yeah, yeah. so that's I'm still Michelle. a little upset about that. Um, Matt is uh, one of the um, authors of Deus Workflow. Has anyone in this room heard of Deus Workflow? Oh man, okay, so when we were doing, um, when we were first starting out with Kubernetes and containers, we we're like, we're gonna build a container pass. And uh, we were replatforming it on top of Kubernetes and that's how we learned about Kubernetes and that's actually how Helm came to be. And uh, Matt was one of the original authors. Uh, he also brings all of the personality basically to our team. So all the Taylor Swift stuff that we do in our release notes uh, is from Matt. And um, on the holiday beverage stuff he also also made us uh, get into, so yeah. Mostly thanks to my fiance, yeah. um, <laughs> due to close proximity, but yes. So we're here to talk mostly about Helm though. We're not about to talk about the Matt and Michelle show. So we'd love to talk about ourselves, but let's talk about Helm. So um, Helm is a package manager for Kubernetes. So let's try and break down what exactly that means uh, in terms of like, um, rather than the buzzwords, let's actually talk about the concepts behind what it means to be a package manager for Kubernetes. So essentially what a package manager is trying to do is to make a set of objects or a set of things that all co-locate or make sense together as one unit. So you can ship that eventually to customers and you can make that available for them. So for example, like WordPress or for when we were first working on Deus, Deus Workflow was a platform as a service, and we were trying to make that available to customers so they could install it on their clusters and make that as a product. So that's what we were trying the original goal to solve with Helm. So Michelle, how does Helm work? Um, yeah, so uh, there are three core concepts to Helm um, to know about, the chart, the values and um, the release. So uh, the chart is actually um, the package that we install. Um, the bulk of the chart is, so this is a directory structure, the bulk of it is your Kubernetes uh, manifest. And so um, these resource definitions, they can be templated or non-templated. We support Go, Go templating. Um, there's also configuration in your chart. So if you wanna like override parameters um, in, your, in your templates, uh, you can specify those in this file we call values.yaml file. Um, and then the rest of your chart is just metadata and documentation uh, to explain what your chart does, what its name and version is, and who maintains it, and all of that information. 
So this is what a chart.yaml file looks like. And as you can see, you have the name and version info, you have some keywords and a description, um, but a simple manifest file. Uh, and then the values.yaml file is, like I said before, the configuration for your chart. Um, this is expressed as YAML. Uh, values are hierarchical, as you can see, so you can nest related values together. Um, and a release is what you get when you install a chart into your cluster. So an instance of an installation of a chart in your cluster is called a release. And a release uh, is a record of what you actually installed. So um, this can manifest itself as a config map by default in your cluster. And so the config map will uh, have all this information about what you just installed. And like Matt was mentioning earlier, that might be a lot of different components, a lot of different resource types that work together to actually make your application work. Um, so you can have a nice list of that in your config map, or if you have sensitive information, you might want to store those releases as secrets. Um, and as of 2.14, you can also store your release information in Postgres. So we have support for that. Um, you use a release, um, or that's like the thing that you point to when you want to manage the life cycle of your application in uh, Kubernetes. So um, you can do like a Helm upgrade, you can do a Helm install, rollback, delete, um, all by specifying which release you want to like modify. So chart and values, you install that and you get a release. Um, so to get started with Helm, for those of you who are new, you can download Helm off the GitHub releases page. Um, you can either create a chart using the Helm create command, it's like a shortcut for creating a simple chart you can test out, or you can grab an example chart from hub.helm.sh. Um, you can download that, you can check out what files are in there, you probably don't want to just install something from the internet without looking at it uh, into your cluster, so you might want to inspect that a little bit. Um, and then you can install your application or your chart and get a release and then like play with that release. So, Fisher, could you help us understand what that all looks like? Absolutely. So let's go into a quick little demo here. And, oh, uh, let's, can we try and see if we go full screen? I'm not sure. I think you have to switch the desktop. Do I have to? Oh, yeah, mirror. That's right. Thank oh, you. OK. Right. So displays. It's, um... Well, here it is, I think. Let's unplug and replug and see if it'll switch over. We'll try and choose method. So we're starting to see something. We're not seeing the terminal. All right, well. What does Gather Windows do? Let's see. Arrangement. Arrangement. Yeah, and then mirror. Oh, OK. Yeah. Ta-da. Yay. Yeah, we're good. Thank you. This happens at Woo. every Helm talk, by the way. All righty, so we're in business again. So let's make this a lot bigger so people can see what we're going on. So um, I just like the fish carrot because my last name is Fisher, so mind the non-dollar sign. So we have on here uh, version 2.12.13, or 2.12.3. Um, I should have 2.14.0, but the demo will still work with 2.12.3. So I will show, so what I've done prior to actually installing all this is I did a Helm init. And what Helm init does is it will install Tiller onto your cluster, make that available, so then you can actually get that component that will track your releases and when you can do the installs. So on, for this demonstration, I have uh, Azure Kubernetes service, or AKS, um, and I have Helm installed on there. So to get started using Helm, we will do, let's try and actually create a chart for the very first time. Let's take a look at that a little bit, and then I'll actually pull down a um, chart or a chart from the stable chart repository, we'll just play with WordPress maybe, um, and just kind of show the difference between what it looks like from the first try, and then we'll actually see how it looks like when you get an actual package installed on there. So to start playing with Helm, let's remove the uh, demo. Uh, it was my chart, I think it was. 
So we'll do a Helm Create. So Helm Create basically just scaffolds a brand new chart for you, um, and it gives you some good best practices out of the gate to start playing with making your own chart. So we'll do Helm Create My Chart. And then we'll take a look at that uh, in VS Code just to see how that actually looks. So you can see in here, we've got my chart, and we'll make that a little bit bigger for everyone. So like Michelle mentioned before, we have the chart.yaml, we have the values, um, we have a Helm ignore for ignoring files if they get included into the chart so they can just uh, not be packaged with your application. So a couple of little nice things here and there and there. Um, and then we have the templates themselves that we're interested in mostly. So we'll take a look at the chart quickly that was created here. So we get, um, this is my chart, version 1.0, Helm chart for Kubernetes. So we're all ready get to, or good to go. Um, and then we actually have the templates that get generated for us, and this is the core of what Helm is actually installing. So again, the concept of Helm is to take these resources or these templates um, and to realize what an application will look like in the real world. So we have here in this example, we have a deployment, we have an ingress, um, we have some helper functions to help us out with the, uh, with the actual templating if we need to have some convenience functions. And then there's some notes. Uh, so if we want to template out information that we want to provide to the end user when we're done packaging this up, so when they install this package, they actually get some information to say, here's your next steps. Um, so really helpful information here. So this is just the basic one, but let's actually take a look at the uh, WordPress one. So we'll go and pull out WordPress, and then I'll just untar that so it's not a package. And then we can open that one up in VS Code. And that one will be in here, WordPress. So you'll see a couple of things change between what was in the uh, basic scaffold thing and what's actually in an actual real application here. Um, is we've got the values.yaml, we've got the chart, but then there's also a couple of other things that we can add in here like dependencies. So we can make a dependency on another person's chart if we need to, for example, um, someone else has created something that is useful for our package, and we want to separate the business logic between how you'd want to set up your database versus how you want to set up your application. So here we want to take a, include MariaDB inside our application. And then uh, in the WordPress chart, we set it up. Uh, we integrate with that MariaDB through the templates. And what we get in the end of it is a WordPress site integrated with MariaDB and running on top of Kubernetes. So to actually install a package, we'll go Helm install, and we will do stable WordPress. Um, let's give it a name. We'll give it WordPress um, on the cluster, and then let's try something fancy, and let's install it in the WordPress namespace. So what, no, oh, go I ahead, was Michelle. Say the name is the name of the release. Yes. So the name is what we wanted to give the release. So when we're tracking the install and doing upgrades, we can now reference it by that name. If we didn't provide it a name, it would just give us a cutesy auto generated name, um, which are always fun to see what gets generated. But uh, this gives us an actual use or a name that we can go, and then the notes. Um, the notes are getting kind of word wrapped here in the demo. But you can see. What we're seeing is a bunch of services, deployments, pods, staple sets that the WordPress chart is giving us um, and saying that's how the application is being packaged. But again, the whole key point here is if I'm a consumer of this application, all I had to do is Helm install WordPress and I have this application up and running on Kubernetes. And I didn't have to understand the underlying resources or anything like that. All I just had to do was here's WordPress give it some configuration if I want to extend it in some way, and I'm off to the races. So, um, and then here's the notes at the end of it. So we got, here's a WordPress URL. If you want to get uh, the admin URL, you can go get the service IP to actually connect to WordPress on a browser. Um, and then if I want to log in, I give the user, and then it auto-generated me a password so I can go and grab that if I want to. So. That's a basic one-on-one -on -one demo of how Helm works um, and how it's used. So let's switch back into the slides again. There we go. Thank you. Yeah. Can you tell us more about how Helm helps? Yeah. 
So let's talk a little bit about how Helm overall has helped the community um, succeed in some of these ways. Um, so now with the Helm community, um, it's not just the two of us just working on this project and there's actually a massive community around us um, that has been supporting and working on this, providing feedback and doing this. So the CNCF, um, we have now been inducted into the CNCF as of last year, I think it was, um, as an incubator project. Um, and there has been a ton of contributions uh, from the entire community on Helm. So there's the Helm CLI itself, which is GitHub Helm Helm. That one has just only 480 contributors, which is a massive number for a small um, team working on this. But there's also the Helm Charts community. That's another sub-project. There's Chart Museum. There's the Chart Testing Project. They all have a huge amount of contributors that are helping out to the community. So over 2,000 contributors or contributors uniquely um, to the Helm Charts repository providing and maintaining those charts um, and working on those. Um, as well, uh, just some metrics and numbers. We've got uh, collectively between all the Slack channels, we've got about 12,000 members. Um, 8,000 of them alone in the Helm users, and then the others are collectively between like Chart Museum, the Helm Dev channel uh, for specifically around the Helm development and project planning and those kind of things. And then uh, we have public dev calls. We'd love to see new faces come along to the dev or development calls. Um, those are just simply, we come together every week at 9.30 uh, local, or 9.30 a.m. Pacific time, not local time here in Spain. Um, but what we talk about are just like some things we'll be going around in the last week, um, any discussion items that we bring on the agenda, talking about like, for example, the Helm Summit that's been going on. So we've been talking about logistics recently, um, talking about Helm 3, talking about ongoing development or bugs in Helm 2. So a uh, great place if you're interested in hearing what the core contributors are working on during the week, that's a great place to go and talk um, and get involved. Um, the other thing as well is the governance of the Helm project. It's not just the CLI, it's a huge group of a ton of people. Um, so we wanna make sure that the projects will be stable and will work together and will be able to sustain itself. Um, and the way that we're trying to do this is we have a governance model that is split into two different levels. Um, we have the org maintainers, which oversees the entire Helm organization and all the projects, um, and they're just doing high-level responsibilities. And then there's the project maintainers, which are focused on doing the day-to-day -day work, getting the releases out, going and do the project planning and all that kind of stuff. So for example, the org maintainers will typically do code of conduct violations in the Helm orgs. So we're making sure that we're um, an inclusive uh, community. Um, any security embargoes for the projects. Uh, I think we recently had a security embargo that happened a month or two ago, and sometimes those security embargoes will go across products um, on the Helm project, so, or just the Helm CLI, Chart Museum, and a couple of other ones. Um, so the org maintainers kind of keep that convers or, or conversation across the different projects. And then financial decisions around like, what do we want to use for CI? If, um, if the charts testing project is interested in hosting their stuff somewhere, then we can talk about those conversations. So then at the end of the day, the project maintainers don't have that cognitive overhead and they can just get their work done. Um, I just want to add here, like Helm is a great example, I think, of a small project uh, that started off and then people were like, oh, like we want to help solve this problem too. And then like a bunch of companies, a bunch of people from different places, individual contributors came and contributed to this project and it, it just like grew. Um, I think uh, CNCF now provides a lot of really good best practices. Um, there's a template for uh, how you can get started, how you can structure your um, a repository if you have a cloud native project if you're you know in your individual companies and you're thinking oh like this is something I want to collaborate with the, uh, the community on uh, CNCF is a great place to uh, to look for that vendor neutral home um, and you can definitely find uh, like these this governance requirement and um, kind of like the code of conduct that there's like a template uh, a layout for um, uh, for open source projects and, and best practices uh, in this OSS project. So just something to um, look out for. I used to freak out when uh, we had like 100 people in our Slack channel. I remember those days. And now it's like 8,000. We're like, this is crazy. So FYI, just a thing to know. Yeah, the CNCF has been incredibly helpful with providing us the framework and the support um, all throughout this process as we're going through the CNCF and helping us with like leveling up our community and making sure that we're 
having a stable ecosystem and those kind of things, like the code of conduct violations and making sure that we have proper governance in place and uh, all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. So, let's talk a little bit. I want to talk um, just a little bit on some of the things that have changed over time as we're talking about as this transition from Helm 1 to Helm 2 to Helm 3. Um, I just want to talk about some of the background context of some things that we changed over time um, and as well just give some like introduction on like the development of what Helm goes on uh, day to day. So uh, one of the things I would love to talk about, uh, and I'm happy to talk about this anytime, is Helm Classic, the very first version. How many people here has ever played with Helm Classic? We got one, <laughs> two, nice, really nice. We got a couple of people who have played with Helm Classic, wow. Helm uh, Classic was released on the first, like we like open sourced it and stuff at the first KubeCon. Yeah. We were like, what is this thing? Yeah, and it actually never reached a 1.0 when I was looking at the releases, but it was, it was a whirlwind going through there and playing with Helm 1. So um, version 001 of Helm, the very first release, was released on November 2nd, 2015. That was timed with the first KubeCon, or was it just prior, I'm assuming? Just prior. Just yeah. prior. OK. Um, some of the concepts around here are very different from what it is uh, from modern or Helm 2 or even Helm 3. One of the things that was originally introduced for the concepts were all the same, like we wanted to solve the same problem of packaging an application, making it consumable for users. The approach that we took was much different than what it looks like today. Um, originally, it used like a, a Ruby-like generator pattern for generating those resources, as opposed to today's thing, which was Go templates or uh, the text template language. So essentially, uh, we'll go through quickly and show what that looks like. Um, we eventually removed that, and we went from a client-only architecture to a client-server architecture in Helm 2. And now in Helm 3, we're going back to a client architecture. It's a little bit ironic, don't you think? Um, but Helm Classic. So this is what an original resource looked like. It doesn't look that different from what today would be. But you'll notice at the very top here, there are a couple of um, top level or front matter YAML. These are basically like generate commands. You know, if you've ever looked at like Go generate or like Ruby generators, this might look a little bit familiar to you. Um, basically what it's taking is the input of this file, um, providing some values that you've provided in another file, and then it's dumping it to a manifest directory. And that's your final full YAML um, that you'll be providing as a manifest to Kubernetes. Instead of now, which is like all in one, the Go template, the rendering engine happens on Tiller, and then it gets supplied right up to Kubernetes. So it was all done client side. Um, and a little bit janky, too, because you'll notice this sed command is the second one. This was actually pretty common in a lot of early charts as well. Um, we would do sed commands, and obviously that wouldn't work on Windows or different platforms that use different sed arguments. So it worked, but there were some limitations with the project. Um, and this is what the command looked like when you were first doing it. So you would do, you would fetch your resource or your application that you wanted to do, which was just creating the namespace here, um, and you would run Helm generate, and it would generate those manifest uh, or resources, and then you do an install. So you had to do the rendering yourself, and then actually install what the results were into your cluster. So now we come into Helm two, and. This is when we started introducing, we were working with uh, Google, and I think it was Skipbox was another project, which was, they got eventually acquired by Bitnami. Um, and we were working together on introducing some of the projects that were out in there, like there was Google's Deployment Manager, and we were kind of working and merging the two projects into one to try and solve this problem for everyone. And Tiller was one of the components that came out of it in this Helm 2 world. Um, it allowed us to live its life inside of Kubernetes and to allow this rendering to happen on the server side. And the early design goals helped us realize some use cases that we were really interested in doing. Um, one of them could have been like uh, webhook based or webhook based polls or webhook based rendering and doing an install. Um, so it could have been like a very early version of an operator, perhaps. Um, so yeah, it could install charts from a webhook or Kubernetes event. That was something that we had conceptualized. The trade-off eventually, um, this was, I think, 1.2 or 1.1 of Kubernetes when it was first introduced. Um, eventually, down the line, Kubernetes started introducing this new thing. It, back then, it was uh, 
access based, or it was ABAC, uh, attribute based access control, I think it was originally called. Um, and, then orig and then eventually they introduced role based access control, which we all know RBAC. Um, and when you are dealing with a service that is running inside of your cluster, and you're dealing with the, um, the roles that you want to install as, when you're providing a Helm install from the client, you're talking to a service that is installing something on your behalf. And so you have to kind of finagle that service in order to figure out, does that, do you actually want to be installing here or not, and those kind of things. So it was a little bit problematic for security engineers to lock it down and to provide the right access controls for people who wanted to do uh, the right thing with those. So, Helm 3. Uh, this is the introduction. Uh, we removed Head Tiller, and when we were doing this at the Helm Summit, I believe, is when we were starting to hear these use cases and uh, examples of people in the community that were running Helm and embedding it inside of Tiller. And I think actually Nicole was one of the first people who were showing that um, with Lostromos. And she was showing like we were embedding Tiller inside of our engine and just running that as a service. So you didn't actually have an API on there, um, but you were running as your local user and being able to do audits and all that kind of stuff. So now with uh, the removal of Tiller, uh, Tiller actually, or Helm, the client, now talks directly to the Kubernetes API. It does the rendering locally and all that, kind of like how Helm Classic used to do, right? A little bit ironic again. Um, but it radically simplifies the security model. So now when you're doing an install, you're installing as you. You're not installing as a service running inside of the cluster. Um, so it allows security engineers to go to you and say, we'll lock down this particular user and can only install in certain namespaces or install with certain parameters. Um, and the nice thing with this change is that there was no real changes required inside of the charts um, because it was just we're all doing all the rendering and everything else and providing that information from Kubernetes. There wasn't really an abstracted model for relying on what Tiller was. I think there was just Tiller.version, and I don't think anyone used that feature. So, yeah. So, Michelle, let's talk about something new and what exactly is a package repository? Yeah, so package repositories are where charts are stored. And I really wanted to talk about this because I uh, helped a lot with the Helm 2 package repository and that's like grown a lot um, since then. So in Helm Classic, uh, charts were stored in Git repositories. So um, you just have like a Git repo with like directories and each directory was a chart. And so what happened was we were changing like different, we were bumping versions of charts and the chart, they, we still have the chart.yaml file we saw the version metadata and when we were bumping the versions it was really hard to like pull down the correct version that we wanted we could only really pull latest if we wanted to pull a specific version there was a lot of magic we had to do it was really difficult so we evolved that um, we wanted a repository uh, model that was distributed we wanted for people to be able to run their own repositories behind uh, some security mechanism so that um, enterprises could adopt this. But we also wanted a, a simple model for uh, hosting chart repositories. So what we came up with after doing a lot of um, research, specifically um, I did a lot of research on the Debian repository model, um, we came up with this idea of, hey, a chart repository can be this basic H HTTP web server uh, with an index.yaml file. And that index.yaml file will contain all the information that, um, uh, that you need to know about all of the charts that are inside of that chart repository, including all of the keywords, the metadata, the versions, and the path to the actual um, uh, tarball itself, which was the chart. So a chart, when you host it in the package repository, or a chart repository is just a uh, tarball of your, um, of your uh, chart directory. Um, and uh, Fisher is actually, I call Matt Fisher because there's like a million mats, but uh, Fisher has been working a lot on our experimental OCI integration. So um, the, the thing that happened with this was, you know, it was like super simple to host your uh, chart repository, which is great because that helped with adoption. Uh, and then people decided to, you know, put a lot of charts in their chart repositories, which is awesome. Uh, but scaling was an issue. So um, the, it turns out the index.yaml file didn't scale as well when you have, um, or doesn't scale as well when you have hundreds of thousands of charts in your chart repository. So um, to help with that, we've been looking at uh, OCI registries as a mechanism for uh, where to 
uh, store charts. Mm -hmm. We were looking at projects parallel in the CNCF world on how they had tried to address this problem of hosting uh, artifacts, basically, for their users and how they did that. And one of the first things that came up, obviously, is the Docker registry project. Um, and if you don't know actually what the Docker registry project, it's not actually just a Docker thing anymore. It's also now owned by the OCI, or the Open Container Initiative. Um, and what they're trying to solve, along with the, uh, the actual specification of a Docker image, is a distribution specification. And that distribution specification um, is about distributing artifacts over an API. That turns into the Docker registry project, but it also can handle more than just uh, the actual Docker images themselves. So we've been playing around with uh, some of the concepts and the specification itself and seeing how that will work. So we have some experimental work inside of Helm 3 to play around with it. Um, we're still supporting chart repositories because we definitely don't want to migrate the entire community over to this new fandangled thing as we're trying to experiment and iterate on this. Um, so we're trying to run these two experiments in parallel and see how how it goes. Um, so if you want to play around with this in Helm 3, there is Helm Help Chart, and that will show the information there. Um, and Josh Trelitsky has done fantastic work on all this kind of stuff. Um, the one thing I'll point out is that it currently only works with Azure Container Registry and Docker Distribution, uh, simply because Docker Hub, Quay, and all the other registries, they work on a whitelist. So they don't want you hosting um, artifacts that they don't necessarily know about because they want to provide good security stories. They want to provide um, a good authentication story. They want to provide a good UX um, for the visualization UIs on their stuff. So they don't want you to put arbitrary stuff in there necessarily. So um, we're working with them with the OCI on talking about how we could eventually start having Helm charts supported in there. But we're still, again, this is experimental. Um, so quick summary, um, I know we're running quickly into time here, um, but we've got, so there's two versions of Helm available today that you can play around with. There's Helm 2 and there's Helm 3. Um, if you're interested in playing with uh, Helm first, I would suggest playing with Helm 2 because it's recommended and ready for production use. Um, if you're interested in playing with some of the new fandangle things that are inside of Helm 3, like OCI registries, um, some of the other stuff that is available in the blog post, uh, there's for early adopters. Um, but again, Helm, Helm 2 charts, we're trying to support them in Helm 3, um, and we're working on that transition story over from the two. So if you want to get involved, there's the documentation, there's the mailing list, um, you can go on to the Kubernetes Slack and there's the Helm users, there's the Helm dev, Chart Museum, Charts, all those different Slack channels. Um, or you can become a maintainer yourself. So feel free to come talk to myself, Michelle. There's a couple of core maintainers as well all across here. Um, and then as well, we've got the Helm Summit EU that's coming up in September. Um, and that's going to be hosted in Amsterdam. And currently, we have CFPs. They're open. Um, like Brian had mentioned in the keynote, it's May 31st is the deadline. So if you've got anything going on in your head right now, it's a great time to go and write that down and potentially come up with a CFP. If you need some help with that, I'm always happy to help provide feedback on your CFPs. So. Uh, if you want to learn more, uh, there are lots of other Helm talks. Just um, search for Helm on your schedule, uh, and you'll see them. Um, Matt and Adam are going to do a deep dive on Helm 3 on Thursday, so that's also one to see. Uh, Bridget, when is your talk? Thursday at 2. Um, she's also going to go into Helm 3, so if you're interested in that, check that out. Um, thank you so much. If you have any questions, we'll just be hanging out around here. Um, we might have to move outside because we're a little late.